Um, that said, I want to now welcome my friend and colleague, um, Professor Chris Omar of Duke University, who will be introducing our distinguished speaker today. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Kajutan. Um, thank you to uh, people who've come through today. Um, uh, it's not just a pleasure for me to introduce our distinguished speaker today. It's also an incredible honor, and it starts with a story. One bright morning in the summer of 2006, in the bright lights of the City of Gold, at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, I was ushered into an office in which a man sat facing his computer. He motioned for me to take a seat, and he continued typing. I was nervous, but felt a little amused that he was typing each letter with his index fingers, first the left, then the right, slowly, methodically, stopping with each letter to look at the keyboard, then at the screen. I thought to myself, isn't he aware of the QWERTY keyboard and how to position one's fingers or one's hands to take, to take full use of the range and diversity of fingers that he could use to type. This became a standing joke amongst us graduate students at the time. As my thoughts wandered off, um, Professor James Ogude uh, turned around and introduced himself. This was the beginning of an intellectual relationship that is now almost two decades long. Suffice it to say, I had met a scholar who in my opinion and many others that I know, embodies the rich and generative transnational and pan-African itineraries of African literature and culture. A scholar whose intellectual life, while rooted in specific geographies of the continent, has moved to enrich the scholarly grounds of East and Southern Africa, moving between Nairobi and Johannesburg, via Lesotho, and projecting onto the rest of the world. Now, as I thought about what to say during this introduction, I didn't want to simply state the facts of Professor Ogude's numerous scholarly achievements and accomplishments. That kind of granular detail is on his CV online. I thought, well, as an insider, to let you in on what distinction might mean when we reflect on the intellectual biography of a scholar who spent his entire life building subfields of study as well as institutions of African literary and cultural studies in the continent. It is important, I think, to reflect on these contexts of his intellectual formation as we read them alongside the exemplary trajectory of Professor Ogude's scholarship. It is this context of intellectual formation that produced distinction. And that is to say, that is in fact to say, as T.S. Eliot, that there is tradition on the one hand and individual talent on the other. Professor Ogude's intellectual itinerary is found at the intersection of a number of contexts an environment of extreme structural adjustment, the consolidation of post-colonial autocracy, the tension between the rise of a neoliberal order and an evanescent socialist vision of decolonization, as well as simply the joy, the pleasure, the rise and rise of African popular culture. This context was specifically marked for Professor Gude by the itineraries of continental anti-apartheid struggles which curated his own cartographies of intellectual exchange, movement, and practice. From the University of Nairobi's literature department, Professor Ogude moved to the National University of Lesotho, and then back to be one of the founding faculty of the literature department at Moy University in Eldoret, Kenya. Shortly after, he was back in South Africa at a pivotal moment, working with the Ezekiel Mpathele, Njabulo Ndebele, amongst others, to consolidate the one and only department, and I want you to keep this, keep this in mind, the one and only department of African literature in the world at the University of the Witwatersrand. These itineraries spanning seven years are the background from which Professor Gude's scholarship and influence on the field of modern African literature and culture emerge. Alongside the institution building work Professor Gude was doing, his monograph titled Ngugi's Novels and African History was about 
returning to a radical ideology of narrating and conceptualizing the nation in the face of post-ideological disillusionment and Cold War triumphalism. This monograph was particularly resonant in the transition towards post-apartheid imagination in South Africa in thinking about how Ngugi's works inspired and initiated a radical imagination of a post-apartheid society which was about to confront the ways in which class intersected and reproduced a racialized society through the rationale of a neoliberal order. Professor Ogude's scholarship moved to a conceptualization of how African popular culture in the wake of structural adjustment programs and post-colonial autocracy continued, continued the work of decolonization. Professor Gooder's work on African popular culture has intervened in rethinking the intellectual histories of Eastern Africa while making generative and influential claims on the political economy of culture in relation to nationhood, statecraft, and African urban identity. Professor Gooder does all of this with the awareness that the scholarship that makes a difference is not just the sole individual monograph making a big splash on the landscape and marking individual talent, but also that in the context of Africa, the individual comes through a collective tradition which creates conditions for nurturing new generations of scholars. In this way, Professor Gooder's series of edited collections, including Rethinking Eastern African Literary and, and Intellectual Landscapes, as well as Urban Legends, Colonial Myths, Popular Culture and, the li and Literature in East Africa, became subfield forming publications in the East African scholar scholarship landscape while creating conditions for an entire generation of East African literary and cultural studies scholars to emerge onto the scene. It is therefore quite an apt trajectory when we think about it, that the next series of collections edited and curated by Professor Gude focused on the South African philosophy of Ubuntu. In his trilogy, Ubuntu and Personhood, Ubuntu and the reconst reconstitution of community and Ubuntu and the everyday, Professor Ogude consolidates on what I argue he embodies, a scholarly ethic built on building and nurturing others, grounded on some of the most complex philosophical ideals of the continent. Professor Ogude's practice of scholarship demonstrates this organic logic in which, apart from his numerous sole authored journal articles and book chapters, his edited book and special issue journal collections form part of a vast and dynamic mentorship program for younger scholars in the continent alongside the numerous doctoral candidates he has advised over the years. More recently, Professor Gude's scholarship is focused on the Anthropocene in relation to Africa with his latest collection titled Environmental Humanities of Extraction in Africa, Poetics and Politics of Exploitation. It is possible to see in this process what the work of institution building is. His slow cooking, patient practices of scholarly convenership, watered by the kind of intellectual generosity that Professor Good embodies. Professor Good's advisees, including myself, are spread all over the, the continent and the world. Apart from being an A-rated scholar in South Africa, the highest national distinction, and the current director of the Center for the Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria, Professor Good was for over two decades professor of African literature at Wits University where he served as chair of the department as well as deputy head of the School of Literature and Language Studies. Amongst the numerous fellowships he has held include at the University of Michigan and University of Pennsylvania. He has raised substantial funding for multiple supranational research projects across East, West, and Southern Africa, and also served in global bodies that work with the humanities in Africa, including the Consortium of Humanities, as well as more recently, uh, UNESCO Management of Social Transformation Program at the University of Pretoria. Professor Gude's talk today titled Decoloniality and Its Fissures, Whose Decolonial Turn, reflects on this journey, the latest of which is making connections between land, extraction, imagination, and cultural production. Please uh, um, join me in welcoming Professor Gude uh, for the lecture today.
Thank you, Chris. I swear I didn't pay him for those words. <laughs> but uh, I am deeply humbled, you know, by those um, generous words. Um, it's always gratifying to see people that have passed through your hands rise to the levels that people like Chris have. I was deeply touched when I saw the young lady from Nigeria who won the best dissertation. Perhaps what most of you don't know is that the supervisor, uh, Senayon uh, Oloola, was one of the very few students that had recruited at the University of the Witwatersrand. He's doing an incredible job, could have been anywhere, but he decided to stay in Ibadan and do some work there. Uh, so you begin to see your literary grandchildren emerging, and that is really fulfilling. So thank you, Chris. Um, I hope that your lovely daughter there will soon follow. Uh, having said that, I want to thank um, Professor Kajetane Hika, really one of the rising stars um, um, coming from the continent. Now, those of us who are resident scholars uh, in Africa, we always get very excited when we see the students that are moved over uh, to the global north emerging at the cutting edge of scholarship in the way that someone like uh, Kajetan um, Eheka has done. And I want to thank you for deciding to invite me um, to this talk. It's really exciting together with your editorial committee. The final mention that I want to make, uh, most of you may not know that Professor Adeke Adebajo is also at the University of Pretoria and works at our center. So, another good testimony of some excellent job that we are doing. Really one of our leading scholars on um, relating to um, uh, peace building you know, on the continent and that's a lot of work um, in shaping you know, the policy direction <coughs> of, um, of what, what needs to be done. You know. um, and I think that is important. It's important because my talk today, uh, we reflect on a combination of theory and practice. And that if we don't do that, then we run the risk of uh, basically, you know, uh, pontificating, you know, um, in our little small corners without influencing what is going on uh, out there, you know, among the publics. The teacher in me tells me always to spell out what I want to talk about since I'm going to read, you know, my, um, my lecture. When Kajutan told me that um, I've been requested to give this distinguished lecture. I was a bit hes hesitant, you know. Uh, I'm just a humble school teacher. I'm not some of you are celebrity scholars. Uh, I just do what I have to do. And so I was, I was a bit reluctant, but like most scholars would know, um, you are told, okay, give us a topic. And you give a topic, and then you are forced to work backwards. Say, and you ask yourself, for God's sake, why did I give that topic? <laughs> and I remember in one of my emails, I was telling uh, Kajetan, now it is the headache, you know, uh, to start thinking through this. But nevertheless, I want to share with you some of these ideas. They are still very um, uh, seminal, uh, I mean, um, putative, you know, um, in many ways. And, and I hope that, um, you know, they will make sense. 
I want to do a number of things. First of all, I want to offer a basic theorization of decoloniality as a search for an alternative, you know, narratives, or if you like, epistems and method. And I want to place emphasis on method and at the same time, you know, add to that a form of activism. The second thing that I want to do is calling for a shift away from the centering of coloniality itself and Europe. And that's very important to me. In my previous scholarship, I've talked about this. The tendency when we are talking about colonialism and decoloniality, we end up recentering, you know, coloniality itself and Europe, rather than the decolonial struggles that have been going on over the years and that run deep, we forget them. The third thing that I want to do is to focus on the need to link the colonial struggles with indigeneity and the poetics of relations. And I want to emphasize here that the idea of indigeneity is something that is very close to my heart and something that I arrived at pretty late in life when um, the Templeton, Templeton World Charity Foundation invited us to do some work on Ubuntu, partly in honor of what the Archbishop uh, Emeritus um, Desmond Tutu did due with the um, uh, Truth and Reconciliation you know, a Commission in South Africa. And so they gave us very generous funds and Chris mentioned some of the books that emerged out of that that project. So I was forced back to look at what I refer to as banished knowledges. So I want to linger on banished knowledges in relation to indigeneity. The fourth thing um, which I want to focus on is the need for us in the academy to de-emphasize epistemology and focus on, not to reject the focus on epistemology altogether, but to really de-emphasize epistemology and focus on social and economic well-being of colonized communities. That we need to privilege economic ecology. We need to continue to focus on dependency issues, whether they're economic. We need to focus on the poetics of extractivism, which for me is a very, very huge thing. In October, I was addressing the American and Hellenic Chamber of Commerce. They had invited me to talk about Ubuntu and sustainability. And one of the scholars there uh, made a huge meal of uh, uh, carbon emission, how they were reducing, they are successful in reducing carbon emission. And it's as if we should stop being negative because it is working. And I responded by saying that that is not our problem in Africa. Neither is it the problem in Asia. Neither is it the problem in South America but perhaps more importantly in Africa, where our carbon emission rate is one of the lowest. In fact, South Africa, where I come from, has the highest carbon emission rate. We don't talk, and yet, the degradation that comes as a result of extractivism, as a result of mining, as a result of, you know, all forms of economic exploitation is never mentioned. In fact, I was telling them that at the moment, what worries us in Africa are issues such as e-waste that is moving from the north to the south. Again, very little is said about some of those things. And finally, I want to go back to the famous hashtag road must fall and look at its triumphs and fault lines and in doing so, I will tell you a story of some really very um, powerful scholar that gathered um, in the Northern Cape 
to talk and reflect on some of these things and what happened and what lessons we could learn from, um, you know, um, from this story. Now I turn to my, my lecture. And I want to focus first, as I said, on coloniality and the search for alternative narratives. In her recent text, Rising Up and Living On, Catherine Walsh starts her introduction titled Beginnings with a quote from Corinne Kumar, which reads, the world needs other stories. And I bet this is something that is hardly new, but it nevertheless remains profound and rings with a certain urgency. After all, the young Nigerian writer, Chimamanda Adichie, has also cautioned us that the, about the dangers of a single narrative and her literary godfather, Chinua Achebe, had also told us that whenever something stands, something else stands besides it. Now, the three writers are drawing attention to the complexity of life and the dangers of elevating one narrative to a pedestal, a pedestal in ways that shroud or simply silence others. The workings of colonialism and its power matrix has always been about elevating a single master narrative whose legacy speaks of nothing but devastation. As Wallish writes, and she's talking about the Pakistani feminist, you know, Corinne Kumar, she says, Corinne Kumar reminds us of these stories while calling forth the many others that we need to exist and re-exist in a world where existences are outside and in the fissures and cracks of the dominant storyline are denied, end of quote. Now, worst point is that we need alternative stories that will unsettle the narratives that coloniality has presented to the world as universal and as uncontested. The purpose of such stories, she adds, and the, uh, is to create fissures and cracks within the body of coloniality and to put together dismembered bodies of the colonial, um, the colonized space and land in order to create new decolonial paths. It is for this reason that she argues that coloniality is not a metaphor. She says, and I quote, it is embodied, it is situated, it is lived. In other words, like Franz Fanon and Amy Cissea before her, colonialism must be confronted and treated as a discourse which fundamentally frames all aspects of thinking, organization, and existence. It is the awareness that colonialism is, fundament is a fundamental problem that makes it possible for the colonized to center their ways of being without seeking approval and recognition from the colonizer. This is, in their view, the path to decolonizing thinking. I will come back to this idea of colonialism as a, to a totalizing you know, phenomenon later on because I don't fully you know, uh, buy into that. Now, it is now taken for granted that decolonization goes way beyond the end of colonization. This is the point that Nelson Maldonado Torres makes when he writes, and I quote, for the colonial thinking, decolonization is less the end of coloni colonialism wherever it has occurred and more the project of undoing and unlearning the colonial power, knowledge, and being, and of creating a new sense of humanity and forms of interrationality, end of quote. Now this kind of work of the decolonial project involves epistemic, political, and ethical dimensions. Anibal Gujano, that most of you may well know, generally regarded 
as the father of decoloniality, tells us that the objectives of decoloniality involves, among others, the need to recognize that instrumentation of reason by the colonial matrix of power produced, this, a distorted para, produced distorted paradigms of knowledge and un undermined the liberating promises of modernity and by the recognition, that recognition, you know, brought about the destruction of the global colonial power. The coloniality is therefore synonymous with the colonial. That is thinking and doing. And again, I want to come back to this, the whole idea of thinking and doing because I believe that it's one thing that has been fairly absent in the colonial you know, um, uh, theorization uh, in recent times. Um, now, he says this history underpinned the logic of Western civilization. In essence, the coloniality refers therefore to analytic approaches and socioeconomic and political practices opposed to the pillars of Western civilization. And the pillars are coloniality and modernity. It is this that makes the coloniality both political and an epistemic project. The aim and focus of the coloniality is therefore to offer an engendered reassessment of the concept of modernity, which as we know is housed within the colonial and racial frameworks. Secondly, it aims to inspire the colonial culture that seeks to delink itself from reproducing Western hierarchies and finally to encourage a framework of applying the colonial methods and practices to all facets of epistemic social and political thinking. Now, as Mignolo and Catherine Walls argue, and I quote, the coloniality seeks to make visible, open up, and advance a radically distinct perspective and positionalities that displace Western rationality as the only framework and possibility of existence analy uh, of analysis and thought. Now, more recently, and most of you are familiar, must be familiar with this, more recently, and in the face of the grim impact of global warming and climate change, a number of scholars have joined the chorus in calling for alternative ways of dealing with planetary challenges. The French philosopher and, env and environmentalist Michel Serres has warned that the global climate change calls for new epistemologies that no longer imagine themselves as separate specializations because we need what he calls a collective ethics in the face of world's fragility. Ceres calls for a kind of restoration of banished knowledges as a response to this challenge, and one that understands the importance of the local while acting in response to the important ecological demands of the global. Kevin Gary Behan, a philosopher, and our own Achille Bembe, among others, have argued that African endogenous eco-philosophical positions have not been adequately considered in terms of contributing to the global dialogue on ways to address current climate crisis. Now, the aim of this lecture, though, is not to give a rehash of the discourses of decoloniality and colonization before it. My aim, without dismissing what the other scholars have said, whether we're thinking of Mignolo, Wallish, and the others, what they refer to as fissures and cracks of coloniality, my aim is to instead focus on fissures and cracks within the coloniality discourse itself. Their point about fissures and cracks of coloniality is important insofar as they posit these as potential sites of struggle and insurrection. I am nevertheless interested in surfacing some of the silences, the fissures, and glaring oversights that dis discuss discourses on decoloniality throw us. I'm also interested in how the recent upsurge on the discourses of decoloniality, well-meaning as some of these may be, have been dogged by major contradictions, both in the way 
the discourses of decolonialities have been framed historically, especially the way, as I said, it has ended up centering colonialism itself and, and Europe. I have in mind, for example, those struggles that were unleashed by the roads must fall, hashtag roads must fall movement in my own country of residence, South Africa. And also the contradictions that have come to undermine what started in earnest as a project that sought to combine decolonial thinking and doing, theory and practice or activism as its motive force. I'm also interested in the ways in which the so-called decolonial discourse has been annexed in the global north to a point where one begins to detect the desire to control and frame the terms and conditions of engagement, even of conversation across the divide. But what are recent discourses on, on decoloniality, in what ways do they center colonialism? To begin with, I want to say that I'm always very uneasy with the argument that posits coloniality and colonialism before it as a discourse that fundamentally frames all aspects of thinking, organization, and existence. The call for existence, as Mignolo and Wallace do, is of course driven by the belief that conditions of existence under coloniality have been totally erased. We now know that this complete erasure was never possible, and as many scholars from Amika Cabral to Mahmoud Mamdani have shown, colonialism was not only experienced by the colonized in uneven ways, but it never fully succeeded in establish, establishing absolute hegemony over the colonized um, subjects. There was domination, but no hegemony. As Mohammed, I just Mohammed tells us, hegemony, in my view, entails not only persuasion, but also acceptance of the totality of the colonial power matrix and its reigning ideology. We know now this was never the case, even within settler economies. As I have argued elsewhere, this understanding of coloniality has, and I quote, tended to create a dilemma in which we express the desire to have a colonial subject or a former colonial subject that has a rich and complex consciousness to exercise autonomy, autonomous agency and, and yet remain in the category of the victim. Here, coloniality in the argument of these scholars remains res resolutely colonial, despite the contradictions of its modernizing project and on its insistence on policing the boundaries of change. Coloniality and modernity are projects, I beg your pardon, coloniality uh, and modernity are unproblematically reduced to two sides of the same coin, a colonial project defined by race and racism. This reading of colonialism and coloniality ignores the fact that colonialism's interventionist power was often shaped by the local action of the colonized. And yet the view that colonial discourse and its translation into coloniality readily contains its challenges and tensions continues to persist. I do agree, nevertheless, with Guijano that the history of decolonization has always been about that of unsettling the settler. It has always been about the struggle to topple coloniality of power and its constitutive matrix. In other words, throughout the history of struggle and one that persists to the present, decoloniality has always been defined by persistent even if and even forms of insurrection and political activism. It is therefore difficult to agree entirely with Fanon, um, like Cicere, or even right before, you know, that when they argue that the native or the Negro is made. 
through political and social instruments, not bonds. This figure of a passive native that is simply created through structures of colonialism is hard to accept, even when we agree that there's a colonial situation that casts roles. But the colonized are not doomed to accept these roles that the history of anti-colonial struggle has shown. The colonial matrix of power could be challenged, could be deflected and undermined, even if within limits. That the, colonial, the colonizer was always forced to adapt its strategies in the face of demands and challenges of the colonized is now undisputed. And in many instances, forcing the colonizer to adjust and modify its boundaries of control and authority. In such a context, one cannot talk of outright domination, let alone hegemonic control. In such a context, one cannot talk, one cannot talk of outright domination. In such a context, one cannot talk about um, outright domination, let alone uh, um, hegemonic control. But perhaps more dis disturbing, as Eileen Julian has noted, and I quote, a self-critical capacity, particularly with respect to the past, is rarely attributed in post-colonial studies to indigenous groups, especially those in largely oral societies, end of quote. I want to use that quote of Eileen to move on to the next bit, and I want to argue that indigeneity is a, fundament, a fundamental condition for the coloniality. I want to linger on the issue of indigeneity because I believe if there's any major fissure in the colonial discourse as it is theorized today, it is the absence of indigeneity as a fundamental condition for decoloniality. The Native American poet, Natalie Diaz, has reminded us that there can be no radical humanities. Indeed, there can be no humanity without indigenous knowledge, describing indigeneity as a practice of that place we are in, the space we occupy, even under colonial occupation that is always complementary to itself. She adds that there can be no decoloniality without recourse to indigeneity. And us, as humanists, how can we imagine the future if we don't know where we are? If we don't know whom we have displaced, Indeed, why do we pretend to love the land and nature without accepting the land's people? She argues that the institutions that structure our lives have been taught to be silent on these issues, especially those that touch on indigenous people. And yet, relationality as in indigenous philosophies, such as Ubuntu or Utu, of when Vivier in South America teaches that these philosophies are about connections and correlations. Diaz insists that it is indigeneity that teaches us that the basic principle of relationality, of care, of tending, is part of the indigenous people's philosophical thinking. She argues that the tendency to see indigenous peoples as people of the past that simply need to be assimilated and hailed into white modernity is one huge lie that the discourses of decoloniality in its current form refuses to confront. Instead of seeing indigenous people as always becoming, we see them as static. So she says, until we confront the dilemma of perpetuity of occupation, we cannot bring ourselves to ask, how do we displace ourselves from spaces and sites of occupation? We ought to ask, 
If you are where you are, where are those who are not there? So, this is one aspect of indigeneity that we are not fully ready to deal with. And that is the notion of indigeneity as understood to represent, for example, Native Americans, aborigin ab aboriginal peoples in settled economies like the USA and Australia. And it is not enough to study them and to acknowledge that they have, they have been in a state of emergency for decades. What is needed is to bring their voices to the fore, to privilege the narratives, their stories, a problem that we only know too well in Africa. They are the challenge of bringing to the fore the stories of um, peoples from the African continent. So Zoo Todd has captured this problem eloquently, and I quote, she says, indigenous bodies, stories, knowledge, and contacts, and by that he means informants, participants, and interlocutors, act as a kind of currency or capital that is concentrated in the hands of non-indigenous scholars and administrators. Therefore, overwhelmingly, it is the white people who control the flow of this knowledge and the parameters of these relationships, end of quote. And do not get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that it is impossible to talk about indigenous worldviews from outside or to engage in dialogue. My point is that without an indigenous and non-white power base, there is the real risk, the real risk, and I quote, that decolonization becomes a domesticated industry of idea. That decolonization becomes a domesticated industry of ideas, as Hume reminds us. And that is something that is removed from the acutely situated logics of indigenous and non-white activism and scholarship. Moreover, coloniality's hierarchy of primarily white racial superiority and indigenous and non-white superiority are rendered in such context invisible and left unchecked. I want to posit here that we need to see indigeneity, indigeneity not simply as an epistemology, but as a method, a methodology and a pedagogy of conversation and dialogue. What the majority of indigenous thought systems encourage, as I have pointed out, is the principle of relationality, what Eduardo Glissant calls the poetics of relations. Indigenous modes of thinking offer different ways of reading our worlds and the, and the constitutive social, cultural, political, and spiritual relations. They stress relationality, connections, reciprocity, community building, sharing, social responsibility, and generosity as key to the process of coming to know. They are therefore best suited to challenge and disrupt the falsely constructed supremacy of Western science. And although I agree that Western intellectual traditions may be useful and relevant in understanding our world today, I have to submit that no one knowledge system can offer complete understanding of the world. It has to be acknowledged that Western intellectual heritage and rich traditions, including philosophical ideas, have historically borrowed from and even influenced by other intellectual traditions and vice versa. I also recognize that Western intellectual traditions do not illuminate a particular way, particular ways of knowing and understanding of, of our world. Indeed, I have to admit that they are not homogeneous bodies of knowledge. The problem as I see it is their will to dominate and their assumed supremacy and their legitimacy that works to oppress and de delegitimize other ways of knowing, thinking, being, living, and imagining. It is hegemony and tyranny of ideas. Uh, rather, it's hegemony and tyranny of ideas has disproportionately devalued other bodies of knowledge as well as damaged and denied the humanity of whole communities. If we agree with scholars like Mignolo 
that the modern foundation of knowledge is territorial and imperial, or as Escobar, you know, says, asserts, that the subaltern intellectual communities have the potential to foster alternatives to Western uh, modernity, then we need to encourage not just the process of delinking colonial modes of knowledge and production, but also the need to center other alternative ways of thinking rooted in indigeneity. Mignolo and Slatanova refers to this alternative way of thinking as border thinking, the kind of thinking that is not circumscri circumscribed by the limits that Western modes of knowledge production imposes on our ways of knowing. This kind of thinking should involve an engagement with multiple epistemologies, but which also involves non-reified understanding of indigenous knowledges or indigenous indigeneity as a source of knowing. It implies that Western attempts to offer a universal idea of indigeneity, even when indigenous scholars have rejected any attempts to offer a common and ossified definition of indigeneity is flawed. Therefore, definitions that insist on fixing it in the past rather than seeing it as an active process of becoming, of resistance and insurrection with multiple political horizons are really suspect. Indigeneity, and this final point for me is very important, is about land and place as knowledge that are not fossilized or essentialized in time and space. The land is inextricably tied to indigeneity and the saliency of indigeneity rests on its connections to the land, where the land is taken both concretely or metaphorically, allowing bodies to implicate space in the act of learning or coming into being. It evokes more than a physical presence. It is a spiritual place and a spiritually centered understanding of social space. It is about place, environment, water, sky, soils. It is about physical and emotional attachment, a place that bestows on us culture, histories, and memories. Indeed, the quintessential anti-colonial struggle was always about land, and although we want to de-emphasize it as we privilege epistemology, it is the struggle about land as an ancestral resource with all that it embodies that defines the real substance of decoloniality. To put this in, into perspective, we only need to understand that capitalist development is grounded on the politics and economics of extractivism that advances the destruction of lands and beings and with it, knowledges that are embedded in indigenous lands. It is, is it any surprise that we now talk about the destruction of lands in Africa, in Asia, in South America, as if it is just a sheer act of climate change, an undifferentiated anthropogenic process which is delinked from economic imperialism. In order to engage a historical model of ecology and an epistemology of space and time, Wilson Harris suggests that we must enter into a profound dialogue with landscape. This historical dialogue is, because, is significant because the decoupling of nature and history has helped to mystify colonialism, histories of forced migration, suffering, and human violence. This is according to Elizabeth Delaroe and George Handley. And I think our own Kajetan Eheka has theorized this issue um, very well you know, um, in his book. If we agree that the place encodes time, then we can also argue that history that are rooted in the land in its broadest sense have always provided the vital and dynamic methodologies for understanding the transformative impact of empire and the anti-colonial and decolonial epistemologies it tries to suppress. So we need to ask ourselves why our storytellers, our writers keep going back to the land. 
The answer is simple. We cannot address historical and racial violence without understanding the literary representation of geographies among the postcolonial writers. They teach us one thing, and that is that land is saturated by traumas of conquest. They teach us that land is saturated by traumas of conquest. Since it is the nature, so to speak, of colonial powers to suppress the history of their own violence, the land and even the ocean become all the more crucial as recuper recuperative sites of postcolonial historiography. That is why Natalie Diaz reminds us that the conditions of occupation are always complementary of its occupation, its occupant, and its furniture. Is it surprising that the economics of human ecology, which has been a vital historical aspect of postcolonialism, remains overlooked, not just by dominant forms of Anglo-American thought, but equally within the decolonial discourse. So my point is that an exaggerated, an exaggerated preoccupation with epistemological issues within the discourses of decoloniality has meant that environmental issues that affect the poor in the global south, for example, take a back seat. The point is that when we focus as we should on cultural and epistemological aspects of decolonialities, this should never be at the expense of economic decolonization, focusing on the material realities of postcolonial societies. There is need for great attention to be paid to issues of economic, of economic dependency, resource extraction, labor exploitation, and trafficking of human beings, now seen as a new slavery that involves some of the most vulnerable among the colonized women and children, most among the, uh, the most vulnerable, uh, and these include women and children. All these, I insist, are forms of coloniality that need serious attention. The coloniality in its more recent form has increasingly become a buzzword, and that worries me, dogged with conceptual ambiguity and lack of theoretical precision. The Nigerian playwright and writer, Wale Shoinka, has reminded us that words are sacred. The moment they become blunt, the moment they become, they begin to become meaningless, then we need to think, you know, seriously on how to feed them with new content. The danger, of course, has been an attempt to annex the word decoloniality for all sorts of all ill-defined struggles, leading to gross contradictory interpretations. This has made it easier for it to be co-opted, to co-opt coloniality discourse and to package it into hollow institutional um, structures that focus on notions such as diversity and inclusion in the context of higher education and the corporate sector. In South Africa, we have collapsed these two structures into an omnibus called transformation. In fact, for an institution to demonstrate that they are changing, they must have a transformation office and a transformation forum, which quite often is simply preoccupied with gatekeeping and number crunching of who is allowed in and who is kept out. Diversity discourse often ends up being a focus on non-intersectional notions of either gender or race. The idea of diversity in our context, and my brother Dibajo will agree with me, has sometimes degenerated into the politics of black insiders and black outsiders. This has meant a crude political and economic exclusion of the African other, for example, while the Hashtag Roads Must Fall movement drew its inspiration from black consciousness leaders like Steve Biko and an array of Pan-African thinkers. This did not stop them from claiming the university space as a South African space and therefore belonging to South African blacks. Increasingly, we, we have started observing a marked blurring line 
between what started as a radical movement seeking to topple the colonial matrix of power within the institutions of higher learning and those that are marauding, xenophobic, or shall I say, Afrophobic crowd that hounds immigrants, especially the African immigrants across the nation. So a narrowly, a narrowly defined nationalist struggle for control was increasingly sub, is increasingly supplanting the initial impetus to free us all from the trappings of apartheid and colonial thinking and its legacy embodied in the statue like that of Rhodes, the symbolic edifice of colonialism that was rightfully targeted. Decoloniality, in this sense, had morphed into a diversity issue that showed no interest in black solidarity or even intersectional class interest of the underclass across the continent and beyond. Indeed, the neoliberal agenda of corporatization of universities that was the root cause of some of the problems that the fallist movements were fighting against had taken a backseat in a context where a narrow affirmation of blackness and in this instance, black South Africans became the default position masked under the rhetoric of decoloniality. And one could understand how the legacy of apartheid and its devastation on the black population had left gaping wounds that needed urgent attention and that no outsider that had never experienced apartheid could fully appreciate, let alone understand the embodied experiences of black students. But the call for radical change sat and easily with the anti-African sentiments that undermined any talk of solidarity among the oppressed blacks. One also needs to understand the role of, African, of the African other in these struggles, often playing the role of a, stand, uh, a bystander and prone to being co-opted as the reasonable, the judicious, following the path of nonviolence, order, and reason, while being used to demonstrate what a disciplined African looks like. In the global north, the grammar of diversity has been used, for example, to focus or to privilege the interests of white women in the name of gender parity, while inclusion is deployed to assimilate people of color into the institutions that in their structure and architecture continue to serve white and elitist interests. Decoloniality has become a tool for selective breeding and elective inclusion, selective inclusion, while practices of the past remain unchanged. Money can be poured into projects and academic work that theorize decoloniality as long as they do not involve disrupting long-held intellectual traditions and grassroots movements. In other words, decoloniality has been hollowed of activism and its insurrectionist you know, spirit. As uh, scholars like Turk and Young remind us, decoloniality is, in many ways, a radical challenge to unsettle the architecture of privilege. It must involve the decolonization of mind and the revolutionary action as Fanon demanded at one stage. This is what Mignolo and Wolf describe as doing and thinking with the people collectives and communities that enact decoloniality as a way, option, standpoint, analytic project, practice and praxis. That is the activity of thinking and theorizing from praxis. They add, and I quote, of interest here is how those who live the colonial difference think theory, theorize practice and build, create and enact concrete processes struggles and practices of resurgent action and thought, including the surface of knowledge, territory, land, state, re-existences, and life itself." End of quote. The challenge here is that decoloniality is often discussed in highly theoretical terms 
with less focus on practical, actionable steps for achieving decolonization in real world context. Similarly, the homogenization of the global south has always has a way of blurring the differences and challenges within the global south, south itself. The assumption that the structures of decoloniality and its layered manifestation are similar among the colonized, regardless of the th specificity of their context, can be misleading. But it also implies a blanket silence over, for example, the struggle of Native Americans in the USA, of the Khoisan in Southern Africa, and the aborigines in Australia, as I have pointed out. It has become a con convenient to engage in anti-racism, especially anti-black racism, while decoupling these from indigeneity. And I'm not suggesting that these are not important. I'm basically saying that at the moment you decouple them from indigeneity, you are doing harm to your own cause. Within the academy, there has been a worrying fixation with epistemology rather than a shift towards praxis that both reveals and seeks to address how forms of violence and microaggressions ex ex experienced by indigenous and racialized groups within the academy and in every, everyday life become normalized, officially sanctioned by institutional arrangements in general. This is what Natalie Durst, the Native American poet calls the prophecy of furniture and architecture after the revolution, which remains intact the morning after the revolution. To explain my point, let me go back to the example of Roads Must Fall that I, I talked about, which started sometime in March 2015 with the agitation against the statue of Cecil Rhodes on the, on the UCT campus, University of Cape Town campus. In their view, this symbol represented those violent memories of British colonialism in Southern Africa. The protests included silent marches, organized demonstrations that finally pushed the university to remove the statue. With the remo removal of the statue in April 2015, hashtag roads must fall continued to situate itself right inside other decolonization debates. These debates morphed into various social discourses, decolonization debates resulting in collective name called the Fallist Movement that would spread to other campuses in South Africa and beyond. You know what happened, for example, in, uh, in Oxford, where a similar uh, staging of struggle was you know, repeated. Now, my point, though, is that to realize its goals, the students moved beyond theory and coupled their struggle with various forms of activism, public protests, debates, demonstrations, public conversations, overnight vigils, chanting, occupying, occupying buildings, and disrupting meetings. And yet, when the University of the Western Cape organized a discussion forum titled The University and Its World, which was a flagship project on critical thought in African humanities hosted on the occasion of the International Consortium of Critical Theory Workshop, it was disrupted. The meeting was convened by none other than one of our very senior scholars, Judith Butler, and Premesh Lali, who was the director of the Center of Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape. This event hosted a panel discussion which included serious intellectual luminaries, such as I've mentioned Judith Butler, Wendy Brown, David Theo Goldberg, and Achille Mbembe on the 26th of May, 2016. There was a marked air of expectation based on the names and the stature of these scholars. Goldberg argued that the university had shifted from being a space for public consumption to one for the middle classes, making it a supply and demand enterprise. Brown spoke about the corporatization of the university, manifest in investor conduct, shareholder valuation that encourages an obsession with rankings in order to enhance value for investors. Butler began by acknowledging that the critical importance of the students' movement in questioning colonial history and the, def and the defined university uh, as a place where radical critiques, and, and she defined the university as a place where a radical critique can be generated, adding that change 
is not quite imaginable without a profound disruption and proposing disruption as a point of departure for a new university. This is this major, you know, four major serious scholars talking. Now the meeting would end unceremoniously when during Q&A, a group of students refused to hand over the microphone to the, to the facilitator and rejected attempts by the panel to respond to their questions. The distinguished professors were silenced and were led out when the students ultimately started chanting, bringing the discussions to an abrupt halt. Now, how does one read and even start to justify this kind of disruption as an act of refusal or resistance and activism all rolled into one? Here is a context or a space in which black students are calling for their voices to be heard, for inclusion of their own, and enters predominantly white panel telling them how to do it. The white faces of Judith Butler, Wendy Brown, and David Theo Goldberg, you know, very good scholars. Theo Goldberg is actually a member of our, you know, um, our board, an incredible, you know, scholar. So never mind their well-known radical profile. Nevertheless, they represented what the black students resented, an academic hierarchy defined along racial lines. Their embodied experience was that of a university with few or no black university professors. And I'm talking about the students here. Their embodied experience was that of a university with few or no black university professors you know, from their communities. The absence of black professors at the university and a decolonized curriculum that speaks to the experience was for these students part of their parted legacy of racial privilege, justification for white supremacy and exploitation. Were these the haunting ghosts in the psyche of these black students? How did these well-meaning intellectuals fail to see that they were the wrong actors on a, on a troubled stage? For students, for these students, holding the microphone was a metaphor for reclaiming their voice, the representation that black communities demanded and deserve in the discussion and dissemination of knowledge in a South African university of the 21st century. It was in fact, in my view, the tension between high theory and the practices of daily reckoning of black students that could not fit neatly into an orderly discourse that was being demanded of them. Finally, whose decolonial turn? I want to use the above drama that unfolded at the University of the Western Cape to make some points about ownership of the colonial, of a decolonizing process and creating the space where alternative stories can find expression. Quite often, even when well-meaning, we may risk alienating those on whose behalf we purport to speak for. The scholars above really nailed down the precise issues or problems that confronted the students. But in seeking to speak for them, they were engaged in what many saw as epistemic violence. The students still remained outsiders to matters that for them were embodied experiences, very close to the bone. At any, at any rate, similar demands when made by the students are often seen as unrealistic and highly problematic. The speakers talking about similar issues were afforded the audience by the academic staff and others who started walking out as soon as the students started talking one by one. Their voices had the legitimacy that the students' voices lacked. And although the speakers had called for disruption of university's regime of doing things, theirs were disembodied voices and lacking the kind of action that students were engaged in. The decolonial turn, I wish to submit, had been hijacked by the professors who could be tolerated by the majority of their audience, even though they talked of the same issues that often rattled and kept this audience on edge. 
It amounted to an intellectual posture for many. And it, it posed no threat to the enduring liberal structures of the university hidden under the cloak of order, of freedom of speech, of intellectual tolera tolerance, and academic decorum for engagement. The second thing is that university space is by its very nature elitist and keeping the discourse within the boundaries of an enclosed hall signals an imprisonment of ideas and the freezing of the struggle within the space where it could be governed by the rules of orderliness and reason, detached from the daily struggles of the students and their communities. It was called theory, thinking without doing, without action. Finally, the students themselves, like the, their professors, the professor they detested, had themselves reduced the struggles to personal interest in ways that did not always coincide with the interest of the struggle of the people outside the academy. The disconnect between the demands of the students and the challenges faced out there by the poor is symbolic of the, the colonial struggles that are not rooted in the intersectional challenges of the wider society that I spoke about. So the struggles, whether these took the form of fees must fall or curriculum change or language debate, they were fundamentally the war of the privileged. My point is that the decolonial turn as it is conceived within the academy may appear radical, but it lacks a soul and a sustained push to connect, to connect it to the wider problems of economic deprivation, extraction, environmental degradation, and dependency, and struggles about land among indigenous and non-white groups. It remains, in my view, an arrested decolonization. Thank you. <laughs>